Hello friends and family, and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for Sunday, October 4th. Yesterday we talked about the dog duty ascetic and the extremes and where the ascetic sits on the spectrum of extremes. Um, and we be began to discuss the idea of action. Um, the kinds of behaviors a person can exhibit. And um, we, we mostly spoke about it in terms of environment, but um, the way a person lives one's life, the kinds of actions that we choose to take um, have a lot to do with that. <laughs> we choose to go camping or not. And I think that this is probably where our study group had the most confusion with respect to this sutta. So I think that this point is really worth highlighting. Um, the word for action used predominantly throughout the sutta um, is kamma. Kamma is the Pali word which corresponds to the Sanskrit and Sanskrit derivative karma, karma. Um, it is really unhelpful <laughs> that this word has taken on all sorts of strange connotations. Um, you go into a coffee shop and usually the tip jar is labeled karma. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen one labeled the kamma. Um, that word hasn't been bastardized quite as much. The idea of kamma or karma is not some grand metaphysical play where you're going to get all sorts of magical rewards for performing good action or to be punished for your negative actions. Every component of kamma can and should be understood experientially. This is the keystone to any meaningful meditation practice is that you should see it for yourself first and foremost. And if there's a component of kamma or karma which seems obtuse or magical then uh, don't don't allow yourself to subscribe to that <laughs> don't start believing things um, which you have no rational reason for believing or experiential reason for believing if you haven't seen it with your own eyes then probably it's not for you right let people who want to subscribe to blind belief are free to do so. But in our meditation practice, that's an extremely dangerous behavior. Kamma, karma, refers only to cause and effect. Most cause and effect is largely immediate and usually fairly obvious if we're paying attention. There are some complications to this. Um, some cause and effect is internal so um, we're on the dog duty ascetic so let me take the 
the example of an evil behavior, or some kind of definitively evil behavior. Someone kicks a dog. There is a real negative consequence to that that is obvious and external. The dog is hurt. They, depending on how hard the kick is, maybe physically, maybe just as pride, right? Um, but there's a subtler internal consequence for the person who does the kicking. That person is hurt. And that's not really obvious to us as outside observers. Um, and it's certainly not the sort of thing I would have ever subscribed to entirely before my first Vipassana course. This idea that internally there's a lot of complicated things going on to engage in any kind of external action. And that long before that person is kicked to the dog, they are self-tortured. Um, and the execution of the action is really like this is kind of this is an eruption right of all of this negativity inside of that person again if you are not aware of this internally within yourself and if you don't believe it don't believe it don't believe that there's some internal processes um don't lean on supporting beliefs, right? Oh, biochemistry and hormones and all. Yeah, okay, I guess I could see it. But just wait <laughs> um, until you've actually meditated through this process to see it for yourself. But in terms of the theory behind this, um, the theory is fairly easy to understand and I think fairly easy and rational to accept. The theory is that there are two broad categories of action, um, physical action or external action rather. One is mental action. Sorry, sorry. One is vocal action. <laughs> And the other is physical action. So our external actions subscribe to these two categories broadly. I mean, there's some, they blend, they mix, but I mean, what else can we do? We can speak, we can type out a blog post, but that's a form of speech or it's a form of physical action. Um, anything external subscribes to these two categories. And internally, these two categories are always derivative of our mental actions. Now, this is where the confusion arises. Oh, <laughs> mental action, huh? Um, our thoughts, our actions? Well, sure. Uh, our actions are not atomic. Right? So if I choose to do something very simple, and I'm not kicking a dog, I'll just raise my hand. So I've raised my hand, and now I'm putting it down. How much complexity is there in the human mind, human psychology, human physiology, to perform such a simple action? You only need to watch a baby move, grasp, develop motor skills to know that these actions are not atomic. As adults, we feel they are atomic. Oh, atomic action one, lift hand. Atomic action two, put hand down. But for a baby, these are comprised of all sorts of stabilizer muscles, um, fine movements, thought processes, conscious and subconscious. And the action of lifting your hand, 
or taking a step is aggregate. There are all sorts of tiny components to that. And so it is with thought that there are all sorts of tiny components to each thought. We may have a gross, reified thought that we think of as being atomic. Oh, I'm mad at so-and-so person. Oh, I'm sad about blah. Oh, I'm happy about X. That is the thought once it's reached the surface, but the whole way up, it's compiling itself of smaller pieces, right? And the smaller pieces get bigger and bigger and bigger and bubbles up and then it surfaces to the surface of our mind, our conscious mind. And then if it breaks free of the mind, it becomes an action, an external action. And so kamma, karma, cause and effect are thought of in these three terms, two external kammas and one internal kamma. The two external kammas are derivative, which means they can actually be removed entirely from this equation. You cannot speak, you cannot act without your mental processes, which support those two categories of external action. As such, you only need to work with the base material. The base material is only the mental processes. So we have some difficulty as human beings doing this, right? To say, oh, okay, everything I've said, everything I've done, take that off the table entirely. And only the thoughts I've had, which led to those actions, which led to me moving a certain way, saying a certain thing, only my mental states are relevant that's the root cause. Um, but it is possible. And the easiest place to do this is not within the realm of thought. <laughs> so if thoughts, mental structures really, I mean emotions also count, um, uh, thoughts and emotions and everything else that goes on in the mind causes us to say things and do things. Um, this is in itself cause and effect, right? These are the effects. We say and do things because we think and feel things. Okay, that makes sense. And now if we give ourselves a clean room, a sandbox, to experiment, which is what meditation is. We sit down, we close our eyes, we don't engage in speech, and we don't engage in action. Oh, okay, just, maybe our leg falls asleep or we have a ache. <laughs> um, so we change our posture, we go sit in a chair instead. Sure, that's not really meditation. That's just, okay, we're just between the meditation and doing this thing. But otherwise we try to sit relatively still and relatively silently as, as much as we can. And our work is now internal. The rest of the sutta is, it can be taken in two ways. It can be interpreted as these, you know, external actions, uh, speech and behavior. It can be taken that way, but it is much more complicated to understand what is going on in those terms. It is much easier to go back to the root and to say, oh, okay, all of this is due to mental volition. So if I work within my clean room, if I go back to the lab, right, and I only try to interpret what is being said in 
this microcosm in the laboratory terms. Um, it still applies, it's, it's equivalent because this, these other states are derivative. Um, and you save yourself a lot of grief because um, you, you really have to imagine a lot of things uh, to think about all the different categories of action when they are external, <laughs> when they're completed action. Uh, when they're kind of initiated as mental volitions, they're, they're easier to work with. Um, so we'll get into that tomorrow. This was longer than I had meant it to be, but um, we'll get into these four categories of action. And by action, I mean kamma, and by kamma, I mean mental volition. Um, not I, I don't mean, but uh, this sutta means that, at least on one level. Um, and the four types are dark, <laughs> which is a, probably a poor English translation, bright, dark and bright, and neither dark nor bright. So we'll start covering those things tomorrow. I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves. I hope everyone is taking good care of those around them. And I will talk to you tomorrow about dark and bright things. Goodbye.